dedication, hard work, dedication. My name is Shanth Jetty, and you're watching Shanth Jetty Art. This is the second episode of Frightfully Based Painting School. And today we're going to be talking about something that uh, was a request from people who watched the channel. They wanted to see how I tackle the figure in paint. So I thought what it would be fun to do was to take um, a painting I've been thinking about and just do a sketch inspired by the ideas I have rolling around in my head. It's a painting inspired by a book that I've uh, read recently. I got the audiobook and the hardcover of called Death Mask. Night Vale Book 2 by author Razor Fist. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to paint some characters from the story. So there were some interesting creatures in it. There was some interesting combat in it. And so rather than doing just an anatomy figure lesson, which there are plenty of great ones out there, I thought it would be fun to tackle this in terms of how do you paint dynamic action? How do you paint a figure? And get us over the fear that people have of acrylic and sketching an acrylic and how's it going to go and, and worrying about making mistakes when you paint. So what I wanted to do was, and by the way, if you have not watched the first episode of this where I really go over, you know, painting, you know, mixing paint and things like that, start at the first episode. You should be able to track it down pretty easily, and um, and I'll try to create a uh, I'll try to create a playlist uh, soon so that you guys can can have easier access to that. So without further ado, let's get started here. So let's start with our gray palette, and I want to show you what colors I think are going to work for this today. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. I hope everybody's having a great day, and uh, I am glad to be here with you and going over this stuff. So I'm going to start off with some white paint right here. This is a titanium white that I have, and then I'm going to add in, because I always try to use both of these colors, because um, they are great. They're important colors. They're an important part of your value range. And then I'm going to put down some Mars Black. So we've got white and we've got Mars Black. Now, I got a new color for Christmas uh, from my wife that I'm excited to try out, and I think that this sketch, this painting, might be an opportunity to do that, to show you guys both how I work with figure and what things uh, change and what things stay the same. So let me see if I can track this color down first. I have a giant uh, collection of paint tubes over here, and again, I'm using heavy body Liquitex acrylics, in case anybody's wondering, and this color here is quinacridone violet, or quinacridone blue violet, and it is a really uh, nice color, a really nice purplish color. And uh, I, I got it for Christmas and I thought, oh, that'll be fun. I, I should try that out. So let me turn this around so I have room to mix and I'll, I'll show you what I'm going for here. So I'm also working on the Tone Tan Strathmore mixed media paper so it can handle a lot. It's a thicker paper and uh, we'll see where this goes. So let me start mixing this up here. Where is it? Where's my, uh, my paintbrush I wanna use for mixing this paint up? Uh, right here. I'm going to use a small uh, square brush for right now just because I don't have a ton of paint here uh, and I want to see how this comes together. So I dip my uh, brush in the water so that I can uh, adjust the viscosity of this paint. And the thing about acrylic paint and heavy body paint is that it really does not want to keep the water in it. It wants to dry. So that's why I always think that it's, it's important to get your viscosity mixed to a point on this palette. And yes, I know some, you know, indoor and outdoor and climate regions will uh, pull the moisture out of the air more than others, but the biggest thing that you have to get used to and where I spend the majority of my time when I'm painting is on the palette. If you get it right here, you get your mixture nice mixed through and through, it's going to be much easier when you go to paint with it. If you don't get it right here, it's going to be a mess when you try to get it happening onto the paper. So I'm going to paint out a little rectangle for where I want this uh, scene to take place. I always say in those early days of learning illustration, but also I would say just in general, uh, when you're doing sketches, a big part of the sweet science of illustration and painting is giving yourself a rectangle to work in. It's the same thing as a boxing ring. You have to have your parameters. You have to understand what the nature of the space that you're going to be moving in is, and starting with a rectangle is important. So you can see when I mix the consistency of this paint, and there's a lot of different ways I could approach it, but just because we talked about this last, uh, last class, I wanted to make sure that I <laughs> it, I kind of followed through with what I was doing. Now the reason why I wanted to mix this kind of grayer, and I'm going to mix a little bit more of it, and I might even adjust it a little bit. Um, the reason why I started with this color is because in this particular scene in the story, it takes place in an oasis in the, uh, in the desert, and I wanted to make sure that I 
I started with something that would give me a color to work off of. And since a lot of times we think of the desert as being kind of an orange, earthy, you know, kind of yellow tone, I thought that it would be good to work with something that worked off of that. Something that was grayed too, because you don't want to use bright colors from the jump. And so mixing a gray or white and black into your paint colors gives you room to move. A lot of times people use bright colors and they don't realize that one of the best things is, at least for me, to getting good colors and good paintings, is taking bright colors and mixing those colors into each other. Then you get a good gray color. But if you buy a bunch of subtle tubes of paint that are very, very, you know, grayed out, you can't mix a brighter color from them. So I always say try to get colors that have that intensity to them and then mix them into each other and that way you'll get a full range. So here we go. So now that I've got this color pretty well understood, I'm not gonna try to cover all of the ground here with this tiny brush. I'm gonna grab a bigger brush here. See, hopefully this thing's still got some life left in it. I don't use a lot of square brushes when I'm painting on Nosferro because I've got my, um, I've got a particular technique that I'm using on that right now because it's a comic book and that uh, comic book is available right now on Indiegogo. I've always got something cooking here at Shell and Jetty Art, but it's important to note that these are the ways in which I've come to understand color and I still do use variations on everything I'm doing here. So this is not, uh, not something I don't do myself. It's just this is a particular instance of me uh, showing you guys what that technique is. And you can see me, the way I move the brush once I mix my paint up is I, I'm painting across. I'm painting across and I'm painting through. And you'll see that kind of carry over. Um, when I paint how I approach things. So let me mix a little bit more and then we'll start to move in those edges. It's always hard to find a place to put the camera. That's the hardest, <laughs> hardest thing about doing this stuff. And it's okay once you have, if you only have three colors, a lot of people worry about how do I remix that color? If you're having a really hard time remixing a color, chances are you're mixing too many colors together to make it. If you've only got three colors you and black and white are two of those colors, then you're gonna be pretty certain to know that those will help you adjust how light and dark it is and then Color-wise, you've only got one real color you're tinting it with. And I, I think that, that, you know, mixing while mixing the paint really well is important. I don't know that you always have to think about how perfect your colors are if you're working at a good enough clip. Because the big thing people run into with acrylic paint is that they don't get that viscosity right so that, and they work at such a slow pace that everything becomes really gummy and everything becomes really chalky. And it doesn't have to be that way. It has to do with the speed at which you're working. And so there will be some shifts, but these colors are blending into each other because they're still active. They're slightly still have some moisture in them. There we go. And again, we're just trying to get a basic rectangle here. Doesn't have to be perfect. This is a sketch. And this is about painting and learning, and that is a very important thing to make sure you're giving yourself. I mean, that's the whole point of what we're doing here. I'm just gonna have some fun here and kind of blend this out. I don't know if I want it to be, be a perfect shape. I kind of like when the shapes get a little bit crazy. It's kind of fun, you know, to have them break out. Like, you'll see this with a lot of my paintings that I'll do. Um, I'll just try to make the brush strokes go outside because it is a painting and because it's fun. Uh, and you want to make sure that that energy translates to the people who are looking at your work because that's why they're buying it. I saw a lot of, um, when I do a painting for originals um, uh, to sell, I do sell a lot of paintings and I do, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not cheap to buy an original painting, but the thing about it is, is the thing I focus the most on is making something that has some life in it and something that's gonna bring some joy to the person who, who owns it, because they're gonna have this in their house. And I think that that's one of the things ultimately that people are paying for when they buy original artwork, which is that, that life and that vitality that you get into your work. And so um, while precision and things like that are important, precision without a soul isn't something that uh, that people really want to have. It's very cold, it's very dead. The, you know, like some of the, the worst aspects people think of with, um, you know, neo-academic work or even the, the sort of, you know, uh, both intellectual and uh, 
both intellectual and, you know, aesthetically dead work of the kind of naive style artwork, which was, um, has been all the rage lately. It's basically, um, you know, a, a attempt to create the illusion of fun um, while masking a lack of technical ability and uh, ability to paint and draw accurately. So, you know, there's different ways. I don't think we should throw neo-academic artwork under the bus as a whole any more than um, it deserves to be. And I think we should also point out that, that you know, when you're looking at work that is um, so-called playful and full of life, that a lot of that stuff is completely derivative. And uh, it's it's just trying to cover up a lack of ability. So let's call it what it is. So here we go. All right, so I'm going to let this dry for a second, and then we're going to come back and take a look at it, and I'm going to show you how to work on this. And you can get a sense right now. Let me do this. Here's the palette. Here are the colors I'm mixing together. There's white, black, and quinacridone. And there's a little bit of that purple. And then let me show you guys. This is on tone tan paper, and you can see that purple and that color shift starting to happen as it dries. So we'll take a look and see what that looks like in a few seconds. It won't take long because acrylics don't want to hold water in them, so they're going to allow it to, they're going to push that water out and that paper is going to absorb water and then it's going to just be a nice kind of purple color, purple ground to work on. So let's see what happens. All right, everything's pretty dry now. Let's see how this whole thing goes. Now, this is the interesting thing about working on a ground like this. Uh, you've, you've got a few options here in terms of how you approach it. For me, I still lean heavily on my drawing. So when I do all of this figure stuff, I'm gonna put down this ground, let it dry enough. It's a little bit uh, puffy right there, but it's still good enough to work on and I'll be able to show you a little bit how I sketch. And remember when you're doing this sketch stuff, it's really about getting into the groove of painting. And so there's this one sequence in the story where there is a race of creatures, and this race of creatures are very wolf-like. And I paint a lot of werewolves, if you know me from Nosfero and uh, my two art books, particularly the second art book. I love doing that kind of thing, but I gave a lot of thought to this, which is um, when you look at a great character design, you always define it outside a general term. So when I think about the werewolves from The Howling, they are a particular look. I don't just think, ah, it's a generic werewolf. When I look at the werewolf from An American Werewolf in London, which is my favorite werewolf, it's a completely its own entity. And that's one of the most difficult things about doing this kind of painting. I think that, that painting anthropomorphic animals is sort of you know, the Afghanistan of art. You know, it's where <laughs> it's where empires go to die, and it's where um, artists go, you know, <laughs> to hit a wall visually, because there is this kind of uh, generic look that people think of that you have to push past. And so I thought it would be a really interesting challenge. And what's sort of funny about that is the character that I want, or the creature that this figure is going to be interacting with, is kind of this, this lizard creature, this sort of, uh, you know, warrior, you know, uh, lizard type creature, and there's not nearly as much baggage with lizards as there is with anything that is dog or wolf-like. So in a lot of ways, that presents an interesting challenge when you're doing this kind of work. Um, and you've even got uh, Patrick uh, Tatopoulos, if I'm pronouncing his name right, apologies. I'm sure he doesn't care. I mean, he's not losing sleep over how I pronounce his name. But the gentleman who did the creature design for Underworld and those kinds of movies, you've got The Werecat by the brilliant Rick Baker who did American Werewolf in London, and also, you know, of course, the Werecat in Thriller, which is a really great design. And so I'm going to have to take some time to kind of think about this, but I have an understanding of, of what I want to do with the pose. So take a deep breath, wish me luck, and remember it's just a painting, it's just a sketch. Nobody should be more stressed out working in traditional than they are in digital. If you don't believe me, ask your parents to use Photoshop sometimes, although we're getting to the point where even parents are starting to know Photoshop. So I'm not going to show you my palette for this bit, but you get the idea of how I mix paint. I'm going to be using a pointed round brush. This is a number four Princeton Summit brush. And I'm going to try to figure out, while keeping this camera level anyway, um, how I can, <laughs> that's the tricky part, how I can roughen this figure and keep some gesture to it. So let's see what the best way to do this is. Let me move this camera set up so I can hold this at an angle, but it's still kind of uh, straight on. And the trick with this is always going to be um, me being able to see it and you being able to see it. So I want to have these two characters engage each other. I want to have these two characters, um, you know, having this this kind of a battle. That's what I was after here. So first, let's start off with, um, I'm going to start off with the posture of the larger, in my mind, wolf-like character. So let's see how this goes. All right, so I'm going to start with the 
shoulders of this character and then I'm going to work down into the figure and you can see when I'm working one of the things I'm doing is I'm painting straight through there's the muscle groups and the things that I have to bear in mind when I'm working but there's also getting the the overall gesture of what I'm after here. And if I paint a little bit outside the rectangle, I don't know if I will or not, but if I do, that's all right. And if I want to move things up a little bit, like I think I'm going to move the shoulders up a little bit, that's fine. A lot of this stuff is just the early notation marks. And so I've got to get those those measurements about, you know, where things are going to be in the composition correct. And so here we go. Line coming across, getting those angles in there. And then painting straight through. So let's see here. So I'm thinking, when I'm thinking about the gesture, it's very much the same as when I'm thinking about a human being, except for the spine's going to be a little bit different. But I'm thinking about that center line of the figure right there. So here you go. And we'll see here. And that's going to be that. And then I'm just going to try to think about what the direction of the character's face is going to be. There we go. So when I'm looking at this, the other thing I want to do is, and it's weird how this works, but when I'm painting, I don't know if you guys can see this, but when I'm painting, sometimes I'll do a strange mark, and it will, because the emphasis is on emotion and kind of getting that energy of the lines in there, I'll start to see stuff before I was even intending for it to be there. I think there's something great about putting your, your marks down, you know, with, uh, with energy and then making the the subject or the details of what you're doing kind of conform to the energy in that. And I just sort of saw a little bit of an eye happening in there. Now, I don't know if I'm gonna keep that by any stretch, but for some reason, I think it just it just stood out to me. So I'm just gonna put that in there as a note to myself to see if I can, um, see if that's something that's supposed to be there, or if that's just something that I'm getting enamored with there. And so let me just bring this back down and around, and you can sort of see how we're forming up the back of this character. Now remember, this is not starting out as an anatomical study because the gesture is going to be the thing that's most important when you're doing this kind of work. If you know anatomy and you have an understanding of anatomy, and what I mean by that is if you've looked at and drawn from life enough, or, and I would also include drawing from people who are, have really mastered anatomical structure, because that's the history of the Renaissance, that's the history of everything. We're stand, standing on the shoulders of giants. But if you have experience looking at stuff, you're not, you don't have to look at things nearly as much because you're able to recall in your head and put pictures in your head of all of the stuff that you've seen before and it becomes something you can pull from. So stage one is, is drawing from life and studying and then the next phase of that when you import enough data and there is no way to fake that guys, there's no way to fake it, is being able to draw from your memory, from your life experience. So I will picture things without even thinking about it on the board and I can kind of you know say okay this is where it would go. So it's not like, um, it's almost like you know you're, you're filling in what you're seeing in your head. And so, and again, I don't care if these these lines, these more expressive lines I'm doing, it's it's not something to be concerned about if they're outside of the, outside of where you're painting or where your final form is going to be. The main thing is to have enough stuff going on to where you can kind of pick and choose and see where this stuff goes. And also, I always say this when, when people ask about um, this term that you hear used in art a lot, which is, oh, that piece looks overworked. It looks like this person overworked it. Nine times out of ten, what they mean by that is applying more force, applying more paint, drawing and erasing and drawing and erasing without having more information and more knowledge. So what is kind of fascinating is I will watch people try to draw a hand over and over and over again and be struggling with it and then I will when I was teaching I'd walk over and I'd say so um you know you have a hand you can use for reference right put your hand in that pose look at it or use your phone to take a photo of it and just draw what you see and the hand is solved in minutes that's just the way it works and so sometimes you know, we will ask ourselves what time it is when there's a clock on the wall that we could look to and get the answer. And so now with this uh, with this character, with this wolf-like character, I'm going to start thinking about what the breakdown is going to be in terms of how humanoid I want the gesture to be versus how wolf-like I want it to be. Now, this is a personal preference. This is not to say this is what the intention of, of you know, the 
the author is and what the intention of the character is. But if I'm put in a position where um, I'm painting something that is part animal, part human, my mentality is always to try to emphasize the animal aspect of it because that is the thing that is extraordinary to me. That's the thing that I am the least, um, uh, you know, the least uh, uh, commonplace. You know, if I see a half wolf, half person, and they look mostly like a person, I've probably seen a Halloween costume that looks like that. Whereas if I see something where the skeletal structure is a little bit too long, or it's something looks just slightly out of place, and that's why you see this with prosthetic ex extensions and special effects work these days, that's the thing that, that is going to give it that, that kind of extra creepy aspect. And what's or what's the word I'm looking for? It's not so much creepy, although we do like creepy here on this channel. It's the thing that's going to give it that that sort of otherworldly quality to it and make it something that you don't see every day. And so that's a big factor for how I go about the stuff that I do, is trying to bring that kind of joyful, you know, uh, sense of discovery and mystery there. So again, not sure uh, not sure how tall this this character is going to be when it's all said and done. I may raise that uh, that pelvic bone up a little bit right there. I do want to make sure that I'm getting just enough energy from the start. And that means doing things like this. So when you see me um, working on a figure, you'll notice that I'm doing a lot of really straight long lines. The rule of thumb for figures is this for me. When in doubt, angle it out. Make sure that you're giving it uh, the proper amount of energy and wherever you can make a curve more like an angle more like a straight line in an organic line do it because that's where you're gonna get your power from is straight lines and there's a lot of reasons for that one of the things that I suspect is why straight lines feel uh, more true when you're doing something even when it's organic is because however you experience a form however you uh, a form looks, its physicality, it is described to us by a light source, and the light source is a series of straight line beams that are hitting it, and they are creating these angles. So angles are sort of the linguistic through which our eye processes things. Let's see what else we can do here. Alrighty. Uh, play around with that a little bit, just dropping in some purple. I'm still working with the exact same palette I was working at on the background. I'm just working a little bit darker. So in that sense, it's somewhat monochromatic. Now, this is the part where you're catching me doing some stuff that is me, which is uh, <laughs> I'm letting the paint do some fun stuff. It's just who I am. I, I, I'm a painter in that sense. And I, since you guys wanted to watch me you know, do this, it's natural that I'm going to slip in a little bit of that, that sort of um, approach that I take of just sort of letting things you know, um, happen as they do. And so you can sort of see that, those little sort of blobby lines that I like to do. But it's all built around those angles. It's all built around those angles. There we go. My earpiece is falling out. Hang on a second, guys. There we go. I don't know what's going on. I think my ear is not happy with it today. So hopefully they'll squash that beef. Uh, so here we go again. Going to put in another kind of angled line right there. And then I'm going to bring the claws in that foot down a little bit. Now, this character may very well uh, wear shoes, you know, and that kind of thing. So it's not to say that um, this is, you know, as it were to evolve, or if it were to evolve, I wouldn't take it in a different direction and, and kind of have to figure out what the hell the fabric was going to, you know, come together on this. But this is how I rough things in, and this is how I get the energy in there. Because if you start with a sketch or work that, that has energy and that feels correct, you're going to be a lot uh, better off when you go for your finish than you would if you start with something that is dead and too filled in. And that is really the tough thing because if you don't know how to paint and if you don't understand uh, the way that these things work, it's going to affect everything that you do. And so you really have to make sure that you're staying dialed in and you're learning. There, you know, people talk about drawing from life and I think that um, I didn't understand why it was important when I was a young artist. I didn't get why it was important. It's because they always made drawing from life so boring. Um, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, it's like, you know, you're drawing from still lives and maybe you're drawing from, you know, a model or a figure. But for the most part, they weren't explaining to me how to approach it. 
And I think that um, you have to have some kind of understanding of how to get something that's halfway decent when you are starting out painting. And that's why we started this you know, particular series with the tree. That's why we, we did that, because I wanted to show you guys how to get something that looks like a thing first. And then you'll find yourself thinking about that tree in the backyard or thinking about you know um, something else that you want to paint, something else you're interested in painting. And so I'm starting with this, but the idea is to get you thinking about, oh, well, maybe I want to go find some, you know, some figure reference or something like that. Or maybe I want to, you know, pause a movie and try to capture the gesture of something that I'm interested in. That's why we're doing this stuff. And so I'm going to sort of rough in that shoulder right there just a little bit. And you can see how I'm very, very sketchy with it at this point. And where I want to put in a little bit of highlighting or something like that, it's really just to define the form. It's not like I'm trying to make, you know, oh, this is proper lighting. But I'm trying to think about, like, how do I get that sort of expressive quality? And if I do too much of that at this point, and if I do too many noodly lines, it'll lose some of the energy that it needs to have. So that's why I always say, don't get into rendering too fast. Just start a, sort of let it happen. Just rough in those basic outlines. And if you find yourself kind of overworking an area, like I kind of feel like I did right there, that's usually a good sign when it's time to move on to the next bit. So let's do this. I'm gonna move, let me see here. I'm gonna move this camera down so it's a little bit easier for me. Again, I'm having to get used to, uh, you know, painting with a camera over my shoulder. I'm gonna take this and I'm going to um, start roughing in the other figure. Now the other figure is this lizard-like character that uh, we were talking about. And I want this lizard-like character to sort of be in a bad way. So I'm going to rough him in right here, get his head into position. He's being, he's being grabbed by this guy. And again, just roughing in those angles. Angles are the key to making this stuff work. So here we go. And I'm gonna have, because they're kind of like dance partners, I'm gonna have the lead leg. <laughs> it's a terrible, it's a <laughs> dance macabre. It's, uh, but I'm gonna have these, uh, I'm gonna have these guys uh, where this character's lead leg is back, just like this character's lead leg is forward. And that's gonna give me just that, that extra bit of, of harmony in the illustration. And so then we're gonna get this leg in here. And he is really, getting attacked by this character right here. There's no getting around it. So go down, pelvis. And these are just, again, guys, can't overstate. Gesture in this particular case, not thinking too much about anatomy. Although you do have to know a little bit of anatomy to do this. I always say that you, you know, you've got your, where your muscles in your leg are gonna be thicker, and then you've got where they thin. And if you just keep those basic angles there, like the, the calf muscle and how that's gonna be higher and then have it taper as it goes down, you're gonna get a much more compelling and convincing figure. So it's not to say that anatomy isn't present in this. It's more to say that anatomy and like where the particular muscle groups are is not what I'm thinking about because I'm thinking about the silhouette of these figures. And silhouette is one of those things that um, is important and uh, you've got to understand what it means. I do think sometimes, like a lot of terms people use in art, that it's a little overused. And which is to say that people use it, but they don't know what it means. Because, you know, it's, it's sort of like playing a game of telephone. Everybody starts using it differently. And uh, like the term art, art used to mean having um, a lot of skill and craftsmanship in an area. And when it was sort of taken over by um, intellectuals and became fine art. It got to be about um, something about, you know, uh, some kind of self-obsessed, you know, search for, you know, your own whatever. And uh, in, you saw a complete decline in its, um, its utility as understood by the masses. Most of the things that we see that speak to us as a population are not things we def think of as being, you know, defined by that word we think is certainly not fine art. So we think about these things as entertainment, we call it concept design in some cases, although even that term has, has evolved to kind of mean less of what it, it sort of means, particularly the design aspect of it. Um, and so all of these things are an essential part of what we do, but you can see how I'm starting to rough this figure in here now. So I wanted to be grabbing this kind of lizard character here, and then I'm gonna have that lizard character's arm here. 
And I like to, I don't know why, but when I think about this lizard character, I was thinking, ah, it was so hard for me. Apologies to Razor Fist, by the way. But it was so difficult for me not to think of the Slee stack from uh, Land of Lost. I, I part <laughs> particularly in that um, insane Will Ferrell uh, movie that my wife and I enjoy way too much. Absolutely way too much. Um, uh, oh my goodness. That movie makes us laugh. Heaven help us. I'm going to start roughing him in and getting his hand, you know, up there. So as one would, defensively, he's trying to stop himself from being, you know, choked. And then I'm going to bring that back along. That way, and we're going to start to get the power of this character in there. We're going to start to get the power of this gesture. So when people talk about how do you paint figures and how do you think about your figures, this is what we're talking about here. I'm thinking about them in terms of how do I, you know, get this, this energy, this intensity. Actually, I just realized I have not spent a lot of time in my head thinking about what the feet of this thing are going to be like. Um, because, you know, I love the... Um, I love the triple jointed, um, you know, where the foot and the heel and the, the big toe are back. So I, I really haven't thought about what I would do, you know, if I was illustrating this. So I think I'm just going to play around with it a little bit. <sighs> Have a, again, it's like this is not true to the story, folks. Let me be really clear what I, about <laughs> what I'm doing right now. Um, I love this story and uh, and, uh, and I will uh, I'll do something at some point, I'm sure, because I've painted a lot of stuff inspired by... Uh, by the Night Vale world. And again, I'll try to put links for that in the description. I'll try to remember, which I'm sure I will, um, to put links for it in the description because if you haven't checked out the Night Vale uh, series, um, The Long Moonlight starts as much more of a um, noir sort of fantasy story, but it doesn't have as many of the creature elements that come in in the sequel. But they are both really, really great reads, really fun, and uh, congratulations to Razor Fist for his... Um, for his work because it's really it, it was a fun story and sometimes I was um, I was kind of surprised by how I didn't know where certain things were gonna go and how things were gonna you know, happen and so it caught me by surprise a few times now I want to have this character's ears I kind of have them back right there but I don't really like that um, so we'll see maybe I'll regret what I'm about to do but you know, won't be the first time I've regretted something. So uh, <laughs> that's the great thing about being older. Uh, every now and again, you uh, you do a painting or something like that, and you go, ooh, I liked that before, but you can always bring it back. You can always bring things back in another direction if you want to. But I just like the nobility of this character and the alertness of this character in the story. Um, it's a character who is mute, and so... Um, I imagine when I picture it in my head a lot being said with the eyes the posture and the ears and so that's definitely something that um, that is informing what I'm doing right now there we go sort of rough that in rough that in and I probably because I like doing things like this behind the shoulder I probably would have a hint of the teeth right there on the other side um, you know, so that you can see the top jaw, you can see that the mouth is open, you know, and then it's, um, but you can't see the bottom jaw, so that would be, that would probably be what I'd do here if I did this as a larger painting, is to kind of imply, you know, that the mouth is open without having to show it too much. And so I'm just going to clean up that little bit right there, just because I want to understand the angle a little better of what I have. There we go. And we'll sort of just clean that up. So right here you can start to see where, you know, this this is going and like where the, the story and the posture of this is going. So when you get down to something that's this small, it's a little difficult to get into detail. Now, if you know my stuff, you know that I do get into detail at this scale. But I just want to make clear that if you're seeing this, you can work larger than I'm working right now, but I have to fit it on camera um, for what I'm after. And I haven't completely figured out um, how to do this as effectively as I want, but you'll get the idea. So we'll get the brow in there. Get that in there. And then let's get that sort of tricep muscle in there. Bicep up above. Split the difference. Shoulder.
hints of shoulder blade. Ribs coming around. Hips. Now here's where um, I've got a bit of a, a missed opportunity here because I was scribbling away. Let me get my paint viscosity a little bit better because right now it's starting to just get a little too dry. But here's where I missed a little bit of an opportunity which was to just sort of define the glutes here in this and kind of get it, you know, to have a little bit more power, a little bit more weight. The same thing goes with the pelvis because I was really busy trying to figure out where the leg posturing was going to be. I got a little bit too noodly in there. So let's try to build that out just a little bit. There we go. Just kind of brings it back to center a little bit more. And so grab a little bit more paint here. And let's do that. And we're going to have that thigh muscle coming around like that. That's a little bit yeah, it's a little bit stronger. I'm liking how that's going. And so for this guy, for this lizard character, I haven't really figured out that much about what he's going to look like. I did some like initial thinking on him and and I know, you know, how they're described in the book and heaven help me, I sometimes cannot stop myself from you know, kind of running <laughs> my imagination running free. So, I'm going to probably have like one larger eye on this character that's sort of cocked back, like a little bit like a um a monitor lizard but with a little bit more humanoid face and like I said you really can't go wrong with lizards um, as far as um, humanoid because there really aren't that many conventions people are much more likely to uh, to create you know animal characters that are mammals uh, than they are anything else because that's what we tend to identify with so you're much more likely to see um, you know wolves dogs foxes cats that kind of thing than you are to see something that is more alien to us, like a Komodo dragon or a monitor lizard. You're just not gonna see those as much, so. Here we go. Now I'm gonna just mess with a little bit of uh, highlight in there. dropping in some shapes. Dropping in some shapes to, to kind of just define the, the scene a little bit, define the form. So I'm going to move this camera because I keep bringing it down a little too well. Hopefully that will help me. There we go, that's a little better. Remember, we don't have anything we need to worry about or overthink when we're painting. As long as we're breathing, very important, uh, but as long as we're breathing and as long as we are 
just being present in the painting. Try not to picture what someone's thinking about your painting while you're doing it. It's a big thing people think about. They think about somebody else's painting, somebody else's work. Well, that's not your business. Your business is your painting and your work. And that doesn't mean it can't be judged. It doesn't mean that people, you know, who know more and have more skill than you, you know, it's like, it's my painting. I mean, that, in that way lies fine art, which is to say madness. But certainly during the learning period, you should be able to, and I, when I say learning period, I mean the period before you have put in so much work that you have an understanding of how you make your stuff. And people get confused about that. They go, well, aren't you always learning? Well, yeah, I mean, you are always learning. I mean, some people are. You have to work at it if you want to learn. When you've had your thing down for a while, when you get to a point, a certain point, you know what you need to learn. And you can't skip that early point and say, all right, I've got my style, and so I don't need to learn anything. Your style is something that finds you through work after work after work of, of studying other artists, but also just how your hand wants to move naturally and how you put things together. And so you have to give yourself that time. And so when you see this coming together and you see this figure coming together, it's the result of a lot of work and a lot of time spent studying. You know, and that's that's a big part of what I always like to say is, is go to your desk, look at something and try to put it down. If someone were to ask me how to learn how to paint or how to get a style, I'll tell you the root of most of people's frustration with artwork and not being able to get anywhere is not learning how to work from life. And I don't mean not painting from life because that is important, but I mean not knowing how to even approach it. When you show somebody how to mix paint, how to create values, how to interpret life, like I was doing with that tree video, rest assured, they're going to have a totally different approach and have a lot more comfort the next time they go to paint a tree from life because they understand some of the things they should be looking for. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to make it a little bit easier. So the next time you go to paint a pet or some animal you see in a nature video that you pause and you want to like take a look at it and say, all right, how do I paint this? You're going to have a better understanding of some of the ways to approach the form. And that's the purpose of what we're doing here just kind of watching me noodle this stuff out and kind of see where do I want to put things, where do I want to get those highlights in there. And again, it's, it's always tricky with this stuff because the colors aren't going to be as clear as they are on the painting, so I do apologize for that. Um, it's a little bit grayed out, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more purple, but you get the idea. There we go. These are just little dabs of color. I wonder if I zoom out if it's going to help. That kind of does a little bit. Kind of does a little bit. You can see me just returning again and again to some of these highlights. You know, to some of these highlights. It's like, how do I go and put this in here? And how do I go and I put this in there? And I'm thinking about how when, uh, if I were to work on this world, the thing I like about Razor Fist storytelling, and I've, I told him this, um, I think I mentioned this to him in a message on, the, uh, on Twitter, but I can't remember, um, is that it makes me think of uh, Jean-Leon Jerome's uh, artwork, the sort of um, Orientalist uh, artwork, which was influenced by a lot of the stuff they were seeing in the East and in the Middle East. Um, but it is, um, it just was a really interesting movement of accuracy in terms of people going there. There was, of course, there was like a little fantasy and romanticism mixed into it, but when it comes to things like painting accurate Mughal uh, architecture inspired tiles and things like that, those guys um, were incredible in what they were doing. So they would see some inlaid um, Arabic script on a wall and they would just recreate it. And it was incredible. So you've got people like that and Jerome, of course, is uh, famous for with Charles Bark making the Charles Bark uh, Jean Leon Jerome uh, drawing course, which was um, a foundation of the French Academy. So if you've never seen that before and you want to learn some some approaches to structure, check out the uh, Charles Bark drawing course, um, supervised and um, I think directed by Jean Leon Jerome. Worth a look.
So here we go. And you can start to see now how this comes together. And again, I'm just going to tilt it a little bit to see if I can get the colors. See if I can get the colors to adjust a little bit more. Yeah, still, it's still going to be tricky. It's a very, it's a, it's a much um, more purple piece. Some of those shadows right in there are actually a purple. There we go. And I like the idea that this fight in the story takes place in this sort of desert oasis. It kind of makes it, um, it gives it this really cool, uh, paints a really cool picture, no pun intended, in my head of what it would look like. So we'll just wash a little bit more purple in there, get a sense. And then something I haven't painted in here yet, and uh, I was just thinking, oh, maybe I can wrap up in a little in a sec here. Something I hadn't painted yet is I wanted to have this character, because his hand is positioned ready for it, I wanted to have him with a sword, sort of behind his back here. I hadn't decided whether he's drawing it or he, he's... Um, just getting ready to swing and he's just holding it in a weird way but I don't know why I found that really interesting as a compositional choice here so I'm just gonna rough that in there and we haven't gotten into things like you know what kind of clothing would these characters be wearing and you know I have ideas of, of the kind of robes and things I would have them wearing but I just wanted to kind of deal with some of the basics of simple angles and anatomy in this video because someone, uh, one of my channel members and uh, one of the folks who's a regular in my chat when I live stream work on Nosfero or any of the other paintings and fantasy stuff I'm doing um, said, hey, can you, uh, can you do some figure stuff? And I said, yeah, I can actually. That's a good idea. So sometimes some of those good ideas, you know, they come in and you say, ah, okay, I gotta do that. There we go. We'll build out that leg a little bit more. There we go. And you can see, again, there's a lot more angles than you might think would be in somebody's work when they're doing very organic characters. Calf muscle. I'm just going to clean up that edge just a little bit there as I move that leg forward. And we're not worried when we're doing this stuff, guys. Like, I can't, I can't overstate that. When you're painting... You got to make sure you're breathing and you got to get over your worry because I'll tell you this, um, however you create your artwork, it's not the method, it's the knowledge that's responsible for its success. It doesn't matter how comfortable you feel using technology, if you are a digital artist who's afraid of traditional, or if you're a traditional artist who's afraid of digital, it is your knowledge base that you're ultimately pulling from. When I do digital artwork or do digital sketches, I use a trackpad. I don't use a Wacom, I don't use anything fancy. And, and people are like, you do that on a trackpad? And it's like, yeah, it's because it's the knowledge that's catching me. It's not, the, <laughs> it's not the tech. The Cintiq doesn't make you draw better. It just makes you maybe look like, you know, you're drawing better. But we have much more of a shortage of knowledge than we do a shortage of technology at this moment. And so, um, you know, it, it's, the, it's the funniest thing for me about all of these conversations that people have around um, the use of AI and AI being an artwork. Uh, AI has been an artwork since Photoshop, clone stamp tool, some of the earliest days we have been looking at that kind of stuff. The difference between the stuff that people respond to is that great kind of mystery that great artists and, and artists who know their job and know their task understand how to create stuff that people respond to. It's never the technology. Just look at someone like Mobius who worked on uh, in both digital and traditional. I work in both digital and traditional um, because I, I just always have uh, in terms of uh, probably since a few years outside of college. I've been using digital. I like to use Adobe Illustrator. I like vector-based artwork. I like Photoshop. I like it all. I make videos as I'm doing right now. Have to know technology in this day and age, but it does not always give you knowledge. Technology, it's like saying you're good at spelling if you have access to spell check. Um, I don't know that uh, Grammarly is going to produce great authors. That's not exactly what it's about. There we go. Just love to do things like this. This is what I love about paint. Just really kind of putting those edges in there. 
and thinking about where things are going to be. Just trying to get that that emotion and that intensity into it. And again, if you want to know why I'm doing this um, particular thing, it's because one, I like pulp, and uh, my fellow Iron Age uh, creators, my brother in pulp and iron, uh, Razor Fist, has written a heck of a good story, and uh, really brought a lot of with his commentary and with the shadow cast and things that he does, have brought a lot of inspiration to my work. But because the people who are regulars on this channel, and particularly the people who are channel members and supporting this channel, um, you know, they're a part of, of you know, with, uh, I know how to do this stuff already. So when I ask, like, hey, guys, what is it you want to see me try to tackle? I, you know, I'm listening to their feedback and I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'll do that. If I have an idea to do something, I'm still going to do it. But I'll put stuff on the back burner if somebody has an idea for me. There we go. I kind of like how that's going. I love, I love just letting the paint do, you know, fun things. <laughs> Painting is fun, guys. It should be fun. It's not everything you do. The learning part is always going to be work. Always going to be work. But it's not the paint's fault that you have to learn. And it's not the paint's responsibility, I think is a better word to use, as opposed to fault. It's not the paint's responsibility for you to learn how to use it. And it's nobody else's. If you want to paint and if you want to improve at painting, first serve the discipline of painting and get a better handle on your skills. Then, then think about where what it can do for other people. But first, serve the painting. Serve the knowledge. Try to learn how to be a good painter for no one else but yourself. If you start studying a martial art or something like that, and, and the only reason you're doing it is it's only valuable to you if you win a UFC you know, championship or something like that, um, then you might be disappointed, one. And two, you might not really be looking at the martial art as much as you're looking at the success or the prestige you hope to get with it. Where for me, the only person who's ever going to truly understand how hard I work and how much knowledge I put into it is myself and possibly my audience who joins me for all of the live streams where I'm working on Nosfero. So I think this is a pretty decent stopping point for me in terms of um, what I want to get out of this. I might come back to it and do a little bit more. Who's to say? But um, for now, I think this is pretty good for uh, what I wanted to show you guys. So let me just pallet up some paint here. There we go, guys. I am Shanth and Jetty. This is Shanth and Jetty Art. We are in the year 2020. 2023. And this is me painting two characters and showing a little bit about figures from Razor Fist Death Mask, or inspired by, let's say, Razor Fist Death Mask. And this has been Frightfully Based Painting School. Check out Nosfero if you're curious what my work looks like and the kind of stuff that I do. Here you go. This is what my stuff looks like. Actually, that's a pretty good segue. So this is my book, Nosfero the Crypt Walker, which is available on Indiegogo right now. The link is in the description. Also, check out Razor Fist stuff and tell them Shanth sent you and pick up a copy of Death Mask. And again, this is Shanth and Jetty. You've been watching Shanth and Jetty Art. Please hit the like. Please make sure you're subscribed. Stay gold and peace. Dedication.